when I was six years old. My parents split up. My dad was addicted to drugs and alcohol, and my mom gave him an ultimatum. It's either drugs and alcohol or us. My dad, <laughs> unfortunately, was like, it's the drugs and alcohol. This is me and my mom right at this time when my parents were splitting up. So my mom and I were kind of left to figure out where we were gonna live and how we were gonna operate. For about a year, we were bouncing between the houses of friends and family, just relying on community. Obviously, my home life was thrown into disarray. I didn't, didn't really have like a home in the traditional sense. One of the biggest things I learned throughout that period of life was just that home is in a place, it's people. And that was incredibly powerful to learn as a young kid. And it has helped me so much in this life, especially as a touring musician, where often I find myself in, in a non-traditional home. Like, how do I locate my spirit? You know, how do I feel grounded and how do I feel stable? Oh, it's actually, it's the people in my life. Like, that's home. So this is my biological dad. His name's Tom Flaherty. That's right when I was born. We talked mainly on the phone, but he called me every day. In the spring of my freshman year of high school, when I was 14, he didn't call. That had happened a few times when he was kind of on a bender or whatever, so I wasn't super worried, but kind of worried. And next day, same thing, no call. And third day, still hadn't heard. And yeah, I said to my mom on the way to school, I was like, I feel like he's dead. My dad dies at this formative moment in my adolescence, and it's kind of like, what am I gonna do in this life? You know, two things that my, my dad's death really impressed upon me. This life is not promised. It can end, and it will end, and it, it may end sooner than you hope, and so this time that you have on Earth, like, you must hold it. It must be precious to you. The other thing that my dad's death did, and it didn't do it right away, was that it brought me to music and making music. So my, my dad was, was a hobbyist uh, guitar player. He had a huge vinyl collection, loved music. So there was always music playing. Without my dad and his subsequent death, I really don't think I would be making music. I don't know if I would have been drawn to this pursuit, and it feels, in many ways, like his spirit living through me. For most of my life, I dated men. It wasn't until five years ago that I had my first relationship with a woman, and it was a serious relationship. It kind of threw a lot of preconceptions I had about myself out the window. I just felt these parts of me start to like untether in a beautiful way. You know, I had existed in a lot of queer spaces, but I hadn't really fully opened myself up to that. I thought of myself as being really authentic and really knowing myself. And then this relationship happened and I was like, oh shit, maybe I don't know everything about myself. It was amazing how such a simple thing kind of changed everything. And to really feel like a part of that community, which is so celebratory of difference, of expression, of identity, of flexibility, of the notion of a spectrum. Once I think I accept that within myself, it gives me all this other freedom to be fluid in, in different ways. Fluid musically, fluid with how I dress, fluid with how I express myself. It was scary, but so worth it. I spent my teenage years and early 20s basically straight edge. Then I started making music and a very time-honored and institutionalized part of being a touring musician is the consumption of alcohol. In like a, a little bit of a cosmic connection way, I wanted to feel like I understood my biological father because when I would get drunk, I would feel connected to my dad. You know, I started developing this kind of negative relationship with, with alcohol. And, you know, strangely, when my dad died, 
I had this feeling like I have to make the most of life. I have to be present. I have to be here. I have to like soak it in. I have to understand what's going on. Perversely, drinking alcohol undermined all of that. I'm less here. I remember less. I'm not taking it in the same way. I don't have like that clarity of mind. I kind of realized I was going to need to make a change. It was such a relief to just be like, I'm just not going to do this anymore. For a thing that's supposed to like relax you, man, um, alcohol, <laughs> for, for much of my time drinking it, did not relax me. And um, it made me stressed, it made me worried. Um, it disconnected me from myself. How am I going to be a musician without drinking? How do I take an uncomfortable feeling and really just sit with it? There's a feeling of a superpower when you don't need anything. I started playing shows, I was putting out mixtapes. One of my songs did well on the internet and I started getting these calls from labels. It's kind of like the dream, right? Like you're putting out music and someone notices and is like, hey, we wanna write you a check and we'll make you a star. I signed with RCA Records, you know, really early in my career. And I was still in so many ways just figuring out who I was as an artist and as a person. I immediately got put into all these rooms with different producers and songwriters. Previously, I had been essentially in a room like this by myself making music. I kind of felt like I got thrown to the wolves a little bit. The effect of that on me was just this like real disorientation about my artistic identity and what kind of music I wanted to make and how I wanted to make it. And so I started feeling really lost. I hadn't been able to create a cohesive record that the label liked or wanted to put out. There wasn't a real vision for how my artist project was gonna move forward and I got dropped from the label. I was really forced to grapple with this thing that you wanna do, it's not gonna be easy. You're gonna get a record deal, you're gonna get spun around and then they're gonna spit you out. What are you gonna do with that? Do you really give a shit? Are you willing to work hard? These were the questions that were sort of being asked of me and in the face of that, you know, I had a couple weeks of just being like, fuck, I failed, this thing didn't work. And then pretty quickly afterwards, I started working on music again. And just like on my own and, and getting in touch with like, what am I about? What do I like to do? What is the music I make in isolation? How do I want to express myself? How do I want to be creative? In the course of that, I started working on what would become my first record, Life as a Dog, which I put out independently. The process of making that record after the fallout of the RCA deal ending, just so firmly established a DIY scrappiness that has come to characterize the rest of my career. You know, this experience, I think what it showed me was that my career and also my life were not going to be a straight path. There's a concept of how it should proceed and then there's the reality of how it does proceed. There's something actually quite freeing about things getting fucked up. Because once it all blows up, then there are no shoulds. There's a lot of power in that. So sometimes these moments of failure, they feel like a closing, but really they're an opening. August 27th, 2022, I woke up around 5.30 in the morning and I couldn't hear out of my right ear. Long story short, see a bunch of doctors, I get this diagnosis of sudden sensory neural hearing loss. My manager, who's been with me my whole career, he was amazing. He was just like, music stuff doesn't fucking matter. Like, your health is what matters. Let's figure out what's going on. Don't worry about music. Don't worry about the tour. Don't worry about any of that. So now where you're at is adjusting to this, this new normal. The biggest thing that happened in the course of this was like, all of a sudden, there was a question. Can I make music? Can I perform live? And do I want to, right? Because this is like, this is an easy out. I kind of thought to myself at some point, like, I have the tools. I know what to do. I don't need to thrash. I don't need to scream. I don't need to drink a beer. I'm just going to look this discomfort in the face. I'm going to accept it. And 
I'm gonna move forward and I'm gonna stay scrappy. This record, I push myself beyond belief, um, physically, mentally, emotionally, and ended up creating something that I think is the best work of my career. And it's called Mono, not only to reflect my auditory experience, which is mono, no longer stereo, but also to think about the kind of broader journey that we're all on, which is like everything we are going through is in here. This record is a culmination of all of this, like the immenseness of one, mono, one.